Welcome to the show. My name is Luke, and today we are joined by Jared Vandero, who will be participating upcoming on the Dana White Contender Series. Jared, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me, Luke. It's great having you on the show. Um, originally, the plan was for you to fight on week eight of the Dana White Contender Series, which was going to be September 22nd. And there is just news that that has changed. So let's start there. Yes, I got uh, hit up by my manager Monday uh, saying that I got put, uh, postponed all the way to November 4th. So another okay. eight weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, first off, was, was any reason given? Do you know anything about uh, it being moved? Uh, from my understanding, it's just because uh, they're, they have like several fights uh, in the next uh, several weeks, uh, all in Fire Island. So they just, uh, like, everyone else goes to Fire Island, so. Yeah, so with everybody being out at Fight Island, and have you been watching the Contender Series so far this year? No. No, okay. No, I, I actually am not the biggest fan of watching other people fight. Okay. I like watching it, but it pisses me off. I'm like, do this, do that. And I know that, like, on the outside looking in, it's like, it's so much easier to pinpoint someone's problems. When sure. you're in the cage, you're like, oh, I should do that too. And then you don't do it. As it, we don't put in factors that, you know, the fire's going through. Like, I, I tell, like, some of my students, I'm like, I can tell you everything. I can tell you every right move to make but I cannot put in the factor of how hard your opponent's punching and kicking you, how fast they are, how your reflexes fill to their speed. And I have to tell myself that constantly while watching other people fight, so I, I just try to avoid it. Sure. Well, that's actually a good coaching strategy to understand that part of coaching is to give the athlete the tools, but recognizing that in the actual fight, they have to kind of pick and choose what they use when because of obviously what's going on. I just brought up, the only reason why I brought up the contender series was because I think the week we just had, week six, was the first week where Dana started referencing November. He started mentioning, oh, we're going to be back November. So uh, maybe that's kind of what was a hint to what might be coming. Uh, but getting back, getting back to you, uh, how long have you been training for this fight currently? Because you mentioned having eight more weeks of camp. So tell us about that. Uh, let's see. I found out uh, eight weeks ago because in total it was going to be a 10-week camp minus two weeks. So it's, it's already been eight weeks. So here's another eight more weeks. And obviously you're not overly thrilled to no. go back to back. Okay. No, I mean, I didn't like, I've done a few fight like uh, two years, uh, yeah, two years ago, I think, oh, uh, 18, uh, in 2018, I did a fight in September and immediately turned around and did a fight in mid December. I went, I went at six week camp, took a week off, six week camp, boom. And, like, that one was easy for me because I had the goal, boom, I turned around, got a fight, boom. It was easy. But when you're like, yeah, I'm going to punch someone eight weeks in, then it's like, hey, uh, you're going to have that fight still. Just another more, eight more weeks. I'm just like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah, abso I mean, absolutely. But given, given the fact that your last fight was in December uh, of 2019, how much of this year has been just rocked by COVID? Oh, uh, what was it two days before, like, full shutdown? Mm -hmm. I was supposed to fight. Was that March? Yep. Like, March 14th or March 16th or something like that. Uh, and it was, uh, that, that week was already rough for me because I was opening up my gym. I was trying to get my gym opened. And that day uh, th that they shut everything down, I was rushing to the, all the medicals done. I called them to make appointment. They're like, okay, be here tomorrow morning in Arizona and Flagstaff. At this time, we'll have you meet all these doctors. Then you'll be good to go. 
then I was uh, I had a meeting with the fire marshal to get my gym open that morning. So I was fucking swamped, nervous, just freaking out. And then, like, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, I get a call, like, hey, everything got canceled. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Well, that, that definitely happened to a lot. There was a, a promotion out here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I am, that everybody had weighed in. It was professional, so everybody weighed in the day before. And then the day of, it was right in that March 13th range. It got shut down as well, which I always think – as, as a fan of the fighters, give them 24 hours. Say, hey, listen, we're going to get through the fight, and then we're going to shut down. But obviously, that's not, what, that's not what happened. But backing up to your last fight in December, you fought a guy who I think I can call a legend, at least particularly in the California area, Tony Lopez, who has a, a record of 64 wins and 31 losses. I mean, that's almost 100 uh, pro fights. What was it like to fight him, both in how the fight turned out because he got the win, but also him specifically? Uh, I mean, he's just one of those guys that he's been around. You always respect the dude's knowledge for being able to take a hit. I mean, I I didn't get my best knees in, but I got him, clinched him. I need him two or three times in the head, and he just popped up like a daisy. I was like, fuck. It's like the head is like he he's he headstrong. So yeah. I knew I was going to be in a long day. Um, I was trying to grapple with him, but I couldn't get my footing on the canvas, mm. um, which uh, it happened. So I wasn't really upset with that. It just it kind of threw me off for a loop. And it was the first time I actually won going to decision. Sure. Uh, because 90 – percent of the times I lose to judges so I was just like shit I'm gonna lose the only downside it took away my 100 percent finish rate but I mean I knew I could go the distance with them easily because I my I knew my cardio was fine so it sounds like you like the 100 percent finishing rate but at the same time you've lost by split decision so you'd rather win by decision than lose by split decision right yeah, no, uh, my first fight in EFC, I I swear to God, I, 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 I liked my opponent, but I felt like I beat the living life out of him. Everyone thought I beat the living life out of him, even him. Like, when they crowned him the champion, there was shame on his face. Like, I, he, go, he told me, he goes, I don't deserve this belt. And it's not like, you know, like, it was just a fight that just didn't go my way. And I was just like, I hate judges. So, yeah, well, I'm not a big fan of them. Being a, being a heavyweight, I feel like heavyweight's the one, di one division where judges are probably least likely to be involved, you know. Um, certainly they still are involved, um, but obviously as a heavyweight and having a big finishing um, record, clearly you can get the job done. Which is, which is wonderful. Speaking of some of your history, you, you became a pro in 2015. You had a pretty good number of amateur fights before that. Uh, How did you kind of know that it was time to transition over? I think you had close to 10 amateur fights, didn't you? No, I had closer to 20. Closer to 20. Well, there you go. That's even more. Yeah, no, I know a lot of my amateur – like, I, my first fight, uh, my anniversary is coming up uh, October 23rd, 2010. Mm. was my first fight as an amateur and yeah no i had i had a bunch of uh amateur fights um i took i took a lot of amateur fights to kind of just figure out the formula like it sounds dumb but not just for the nerves but i learned a few things about myself uh there was a there was a big stint that i lost like four or five amateur fights in a row i'm just like why the fuck am i losing it's like in the practice room fucking nailing it mm -hmm. performance why i'm falling flat on my face i'm looking like an idiot i'm busting my ass off but i'm, I'm failing mm -hmm. um and uh, you know a lot of it was mental a lot of it was things i needed to uh things i needed to do uh to get better. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, that makes sense 
to think that it, this sport is so one person versus one person. If it was a team sport, you could feel a little off or maybe some things not click in football and you know, you could still make it. You could still figure it out. You know, we see yeah. that in pros all the time. You could drop three passes, but if you catch the winning touchdown, it's all good. And you don't really have that in fights. What do you remember what made the switch? Was it, was it like you said, mental? Was it more just experience kind of getting the gym experience to translate into the fight experience? Or what do you think made the difference? Uh, it was a bit of everything uh, because, uh, let's see. Uh, there was a handful of fights that I was going through a bad breakup. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I remember, like, after, like, 2010, 2011, I was going, breaking up with my first girlfriend and, you know, your first love type thing. You know how, like, oh, my God, this is the worst thing ever type of experience. Then, I, you know, then I started seeing like this one chick that you know I was head over heels with for like 10 years prior to that and then that went down the drain and I'm just like I had all these distractions in my mm. personal life and then I go in a fight I can't perform I'm like why why is that and then I just started kind of looking at these things and then I try to blame other other instances on that where I'm just like oh uh I'm like it's because of this it's because of that it's and then it's just like, ah, oh, just maybe I need to pull my head out of my ass. And, you know, more people I went with, more times I trained at different places, more it just I got comfortable in, you know, a shittier environment. Not not saying like just being in city shittier situations, forcing me to overcome, you know, myself. Like, hey, you can do this, you know, shit happening today, tomorrow, you can do this, you know. And it's just a combination, just being self-aware that, you know, your outside problems do affect you personally and professionally in the sport. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's very, I think that's very wise. That's a good thing to have learned when you were an amateur, because we've seen that happen at the pro level, obviously. And th that's a big part, particularly because your name is your brand. It's not like people root here, obviously root for the Steelers. They have to learn to love and to root for you specifically. That's what's great about MMA, that people get their, get their favorite fighters and will root for them forever. Um, but at the same time, it can be work to kind of develop you as a person and as a fighter. Now, you mentioned opening up your own gym. What's the name of it and how's that going? Uh, it's Team Quest Athletic Center. It's just a franchise under the Team Quest name. Uh, it's doing all right, considering I opened at the best possible prime season of COVID-19. Yes, yes. I was like, yeah, nothing better. Uh, no, uh, when California uh, allowed gyms to open, we opened and we just stayed open. Okay. Uh, we we kind of just, I, I like, honestly, like, not, I'm not discrediting this, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, people are dying, but, I mean, I'm sorry. Math simply trumps the answer. It's like 1% of 1% are dying. And, like, I can't stop my day in for, like, 1% of of 1%. I was like, I barely care about people I kind of like. Imagine about me caring about people I don't even know. I'm an asshole, I know. I'm not going to act like I have a halo over my head. Well, you're in a rough you're in a rough spot being in California, obviously. But oh, it's California. You, it's all a rough spot. Yeah, yeah. But given but given the fact that well, at least you don't have a forest fire burning your place down, I guess so. No, no, no. We got that too. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, we got like uh, what was it Saturday? I had to pick up my daughter. She was spending time with grandma. Uh, had to go pick her up, and uh, yeah, there was like a. Uh, giant brush fire mm. uh there's one actually blocking the other entrance of hammett there's like california is on fire we have the virus we have our governor who's an idiot too yeah you guys got the triple threat there um yeah. but given the fact obviously you started opening it in the worst time but what what led you to want to open up your own your own gym uh I didn't. <laughs> to be honest, I really didn't. I um, 
I know like I've been in this sport to know the politics of the of opening a gym. It's difficult, it's hard. And if you don't put your ducks in the right row, it could really fuck you hard. Mm-hmm. Um if you aren't a gym that has a pl- a plethora of high level athletes making you money, it's going to be hard. And on the other turn, you have to find out what's going to work. And having, like, I've learned that if you're going to have a gym, you're going to have to focus on having kids' classes mm-hmm. and focusing on a lot of people under the age of 18. And that's kind of where I put my, my focus on is just high school, middle school, and even elementary school kids because that's, those are the kids that I want to learn. And right now, parents want their kids out of their house for at least – 10 minutes they're like yo i love you but stay the fuck over there for 10 minutes and they just drop they come in like hey you know what get your workout on and most of the kids enjoy it uh parents around here so far don't force their kids to do it which is awesome i don't like those parents it's like you must learn how to fight because i said so and you're gonna enjoy it oh parents here are cool their kids are amazing uh, so that helps, but yeah, no, it, it sucks opening at this time. And, you know, we're, even then we're still h- held back short some numbers because of the virus right. and because of the financial strain, because I mean, this is still a business. I can't just be like, Oh, you all come in for free. Right. And, yes. Yeah. You're a business owner now. Yeah. And, and from what I'm told about the East coast, that you guys don't really have as many MMA gyms, but you have a striking gym over here, a jiu-jitsu gym over there, a wrestling gym over there, and each of them costs separate fees, and they're all about $100, $200 each, I'm assuming. Am yeah, I kind you, of correct? Yeah, kind of correct. There, there's a few. It depends on where you are. When I, when I was spending time in Philadelphia, I felt like that was a little bit more Pittsburgh- where I'm now in probably has a little bit more of blended gyms, but definitely in Philadelphia, there were, you know, Muay Thai gyms, BJJ gyms, definitely separate. Now, obviously, you're, as you're pointing out, um, that can rack up a big bill for people. Yeah. I think sometimes a BJJ gym may have become kind of like a brother or sister gym to a Muay Thai gym, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, um, they correlate and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, correlate, stuff like that. And obviously, the, the thing with the business side is, um, I, I know there's a, a BJJ, it's a Gracie affiliate gym in Pittsburgh, um, but I've talked to some of the main guys there, and they said it's all about the kids, you know, because the kids are where, and plus, you can you can feel like you're making an impact on a kid's life, too. It's not, yeah. it, it's good for money, but it's also a big deal for them. Um, not just with COVID, but also with things like cyberbullying and just being too addicted to their phones. It can be a big thing to actually feel like they're accomplishing something in real life versus on, you know, on the phone. And I think they go to down to about five. You said you go down to elementary school, so you're in that range. Yeah, no, I actually start at four. Four. Like, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, like we have kids, we have a bunch of four-year-olds coming in. And, you know, a lot of them feel comfortable bringing four-year-olds because my three-year-old runs around. She takes class. Sure. And, she, you know, they see her. They see other four-year-olds and kids their size. And they get a little bit more comfortable. Sure. Uh, I ha- uh, during camp, I've kind of neglected being a coach as much because, again, I'm in camp. Right. And I have a, I've, I have two, uh, two assistants that are usually working that I trust um, to teach the kids. Uh, a lot of the kids uh, worked with one of my assistants for like three plus years. So, I mean, there's no point of replacing him. I mean, he's still my assistant. He's a kid himself, but he's using this as experience to teach. Uh, he wants to become a teacher uh, someday. So, He's using this as teaching experiences, and he enjoys teaching these kids. So I'm like, all right, cool. I have someone that likes teaching, wants to teach, and kids resonate with him. Uh, yeah, I I would teach more if I'm I'm, I'm tired. Uh, like that's the best way to put it. I am tired. Uh, this camp has been rough. 
Um, so yeah, no, I'm tired and I've had people helping me out. And like today, uh, I'm actually at my gym. Uh, I bring in another guy, uh, Anthony Prades, uh, to teach because I mean, I'm a heavyweight. I can't I, like, I, I'm good. I'm very technical for a heavyweight, but there's just certain things I cannot explain to my 145ers or my 155ers more so than someone that's 145, 135, you know. I can't explain the little, like, little man game precisely as a little guy. Sorry. It's just, I mean, I deal with smaller guys trying to teach me jiu-jitsu. Like, the technique works and solid, but when you're going against a guy that's 120 and you're 120, it's not a guy going 220 and 220. It's like there's just certain things that are a bit harder. You have to calculate uh, size and where the strength and muscle is sure. and stuff like that. So, like, I have a smaller guy coming in. Uh, he's teaching right now, and the kids love him. The parents love him. And my adult classes, they all appreciate having that variety. And stylistically, he predominantly is a wrestler with the uh, boxing skills. And he's a black belt. Uh, so people are drawn to that, whereas I'm predominantly a Muay Thai guy, and uh, I'm a brown belt in jiu-jitsu myself, and yeah, so it helps having all that together. You're also pointing out that at this point, 25 plus years in an MMA, being MMA, is there's still different ways to approach the game. There's more of the grappling, wrestling base with jiu-jitsu, there's more of the striking, and so, obviously, I think that's going to continue even as MMA becomes a bigger and bigger sport as MMA. I think just naturally speaking, even if an athlete learns everything at one time, they're still going to be slightly uh, gravitate more to one sport than the other. Did you learn Muay Thai first? Is that how you got started on this process? No, I actually wrestled in high school. Uh, I, like, I grew up, like, I grew up in the ghettos of, you know, just grow up poor, you know, always being told, like, watching Rocky as a kid, blood sport. So everyone was like, oh, get in boxing, get in boxing. Uh, it's just, you know, I was too poor to go into a boxing gym. And then once high school came around, I was like, you know what? If I can't box, I'll wrestle. So I wrestled. I wrestled for three years. In my senior year, I would have maybe done better if I didn't dislocate my shoulder at the end of the season. Um, got that pop back into place jumped into uh, Muay Thai and because I had three years of wrestling, I was like, I was trying to wrestle everybody. And like the first week, um, a guy named Kiko, he looked at uh, the uh, two other coaches and they uh, one Corey Grant, who eventually became more of my head time, head coaches and eventually sold me the gym that I currently own. Uh, Corey Grant happened to be a Michigan or University of Michigan D1 wrestler. He was an NCAA finalist. So the dude was a legit wrestler. Like he knew how to wrestle. Uh, but Kiko looked at him and uh, Mike Palo, another uh, high level wrestler, looked at both of them, looked at me, pointed at them and goes, you see those two fuckers? They can't fucking kick to save their goddamn life. And the first week, he had me kicking in the bag over a 1,000 times. Right. Um, so I learned how to kick. And, you know, like I said, I was watching, you know, Kickboxer, Bloodsport, Rocky. So all those, like, past, like, white, like idolizing Van Damme and stuff, I'm like, oh, shit, this is as awesome as I thought it was going to be. So I just really gravitated to the Muay Thai aspect. Uh I did the jiu-jitsu, never been a big fan of the gi, hence why I'm still only a brown belt. Just, it, like, I, I like my no-gi stuff, but when I was, uh, like, when I was wrestling, I was more intrigued with it actually by sambo than I was by jiu-jitsu. But you can't find sambo in the United States at all. And, um, no, and I was always – interested in sambo so i actually started picking up leg locks i mean this is 2010 when you would like watch youtube videos and they're not the same quality as they are today you can actually watch a youtube video and learn something proper technique then there were just quick demonstrations where you're like fuck slow down pause 
da, da, step, pause, stop, go, play. And just, it was so, it was a different time. And that was only 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I bet you mentioned Sambo. I bet in another 10 years, um, there'll be Sambo uh, popping up here because that's another avenue that people could do. That they, they do have a world stage. They have international Sambo tournaments. So it could become kind of its own channel for uh for mma in our area obviously dagestan and all of those russian influenced areas are big into it yeah i mean you look at uh i mean you got fedor and khabib you know some would argue fedor was the greatest fighter of all time he was a, a multi-world champion right. sambo right i mean you look at his fight with kendall randleman he bounces on off his head because you know it's not the first time he's been bounced off of his head and he was like, you know what? I'm going to use this bounce off my head to transition to Kamora. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, look at Habib. He's made just, I'm going to hold you here and beat you up. Yeah. And that's very Sambo-esque. Yeah, I think the style, it's, it's cool to see kind of, you know, 25 years in MMA, it's cool to see a new successful style, you know, because obviously I think it's never, I don't think MMA is ever going to stop evolving because just when one um, technique becomes really, really good, another technique will come along and be slightly maybe better in a certain uh, situation. Yeah. So that's what's, that's what's cool and exciting. And also getting back to your gym and everything, what's really cool with you is as a gym owner, you also have to be good at surrounding yourself with, like you were saying, coaches at different weights, different styles. Does that also influence you, how you train now? Do you find yourself being a little bit more diverse in your camp or are you keeping your camp pretty consistent with what you've been doing? Uh, a little bit of both. I like to, I'm never afraid to ask questions. Uh, and if I, I ask all my coaches, uh, my, Hey, do I need a new partner? Do, should I get someone new? Uh, I try to bring in new people. So I try to get influences everywhere I can. I, I mean, one of my coaches is, uh, you know, Joe daddy Stevenson. Wow. You know, yeah. So I mean, yeah. he's never he's he's never shy uh, to tell me what I need to improve. Um, you know, I I get world class athletes. I I mean, I've been training with Dom, coming up this fight with Jans. I mean, I mean, I got literally the next light heavyweight UFC champion in my room. I'm training with him. I got Sam Alvey. You know, who uh, I've been training with for God knows how long. You know, I got, I got the a bunch of light heavyweights, so I'm constantly having to be quicker for a heavyweight mm -hmm. than just, oh, I'm going to power shot everyone. Plus, I don't hit that hard. I really don't. I was like, I mean, like, if you look, you're like, oh, you have a lot of finishes, but I'm like, I've only technically have one knockout. Like, one, boom, goes to sleep. I've had, like, three, four submissions, something like that. And a lot of TKOs. Uh, so, I mean, I don't really hit people hard where they're just. Right. I like, I'll bloody, I'll bloody a motherfucker up, but you like, like, you're, it's going to be a long, drawn out torture of just getting hit in the head. Not that. Well, right. I'm, I'm like, I'm no Francis. I know that for a fact. Yes. Well, you know, here's the interesting part. You know, now we're talking UFC heavyweight picture. And one of the things that's exciting is certainly Francis, you know, Francis is what the heavyweight division loves to, to kind of trot out, right? Because he just starches people with one punch. But at the same time, what I love about both Stipe and DC, who just finished their trilogy, is neither of those guys, now obviously they have their finishes, but neither of those guys are necessarily that massive one punch knockout that um that obviously mark hunt used to be or 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 uh Nganu is so in the heavyweight division what do you think is important for you to be successful uh like that's an interesting question for me uh just try to improve i mean everywhere i'm not i'm not one of those guys that are like oh i must succeed here and here I mean, personally, I do think Stipe does hit harder than me, even when he walks around at 230, 240. He does have all – he has that not beautiful knockout over Verdum. Yeah. Uh, 
the fading back, yes. the fading back counter. That was a beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Like I mean, I think Stipe does hit harder than a lot of people give credit. Uh, he's very. Uh, he has a high, uh, high, uh, high level fight IQ. DC is just it's DC. I think DC would have beaten Francis easily, stylistically. Right. Um, I he, say he basically if, fought the 205 version of Francis when he fought Rumble Johnson twice. That's kind of the yeah. 205 version of Francis. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think stylistically, for me, my hardest opponents would be Curtis Blades mm. and DC. Okay. Uh, I would like I would take Francis Nagano <laughs> over Curtis Blades any day. Can you can you explain that? Um, uh, one, I don't think, uh, I think Curtis Blades has more tools to beat me. Mm, sure. Like his, his, okay. I have gone with Olympic level wrestlers and high level black belts. A high level wrestler beats a black belt any day. I don't, I don't give a rat's ass. Mm -hmm. What? What you say? I like a high level wrestler to me is like apex predator over a black belt and you give a high level wrestler two or three submissions yeah. and all the defenses of in the world you got a fucking monster right now on the flip side of that you got the apex predator of a striker right now i like francis i'm a big francis fan but stylistically his boxing is Fundamentally garbage. If you try to argue with me that his boxing is superior to fucking anyone, I would slap you dead where you stand. What he has is a death touch. He yeah. touches you, you go to sleep. Yeah. All right? Like, I'm not going to act like he can't knock me out, but I'm saying he's not going to knock me out on a technical role price. He's right. not going to set up a crazy left hook. He's going to just swing until he connects. Yeah. Great example is I do not think he's a better striker than Rosenstroke. I yeah, I was just going to bring that up. That's a great example of that. A guy with the kickboxing pedigree of Rosenstroke. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know who I'd like to see him go against just for the laughs is uh, fucking Badahara. He's got or, or his title shot next. Or Rico. Oh, yeah. No, I know. He got I know. Shot. But, like, I'm just saying, like, yeah. I would like to see him go against guys his size that only strike. Okay. And if you're going to come at them with the, like, like you look at Bar Bada and Rico for who in the heavyweight, glory heavyweight champion, or even go on the boxing side of it, like Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury, uh, even uh, Anthony, Anthony Joshua, Andy Ruiz all hard hitters. So I don't necessarily think Francis could hang with any of those guys. And those guys know how to take a punch better than I think some of the MMA fighters do. Because that's all they do is get punched in the head, punched in the body. Whereas the MMA fighters, you're getting punched in the head, but you're also taking down, wrestling, grappling, oh, defense, grab. all of that. So it's a lot harder than just oh, let's practice the head movement, practice all that. You you so, uh, well, I don't so, want to. I don't want to keep you. I can see your your people are starting to come in. Oh no, no, well, I, I, no! This is my locker room. This is like my crappy locker room. Oh, this but, is oh, this is beautiful. Oh, there you yeah. go. Hey, well, that's yeah. nice. We get a nice little tour of your gym. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just in my storage slash locker room. I had a I had a question. Um, it, it it doesn't really relate to Francis, but it did come to my mind. You're ranked on Tapology in South Africa. So I have to ask, when did you have a fight in South Africa? How'd all that go down? Unless Tapology's got it wrong. No, I've fought four times in South Africa. Okay, and that's for that, that's for EFC. That, yeah, I was gonna say, cause it's called um, World or something, right? So Yeah, Extreme uh, Championship Fighting. There you go, and, and worldwide, so. So what was it like going down? I, I'm asking you about South Africa because that, that means you're out of your time zone. You're in a different environment. What's it like acclimating 
because one of the things the UFC does a lot is it takes fighters, once COVID's over, of course, it's currently taking fighters to Fight Island, and some fighters did well there, some fighters did. We remember uh, Kane Vasquez fighting at, uh, fighting at, uh, at Verdum and uh, exactly. yeah, in Mexico City. Mexico City. So what, so what was it like for you to get four fights in a completely different continent, completely different area? What was that like for you in your career? At first, uh, actually, it wasn't that bad. To be honest, it uh, like it got to the point where more people were asking me how to acclimate than like anything else. They're like, how, how do you do it? I'm just like, well, one, it helps I'm in zom uh, Zomiac, so <laughs> I, I don't sleep. Um, you know, I, I try to at least, you know, when, once I arrive, stay up as long as I can uh, at night, go to sleep. Uh, I try to adjust myself as quickly as possible. South Africa actually has higher, uh, uh, higher elevation than it does here. So I was worried about my cardio. Uh, they're about four to 5,000 feet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm currently at like 2,000 feet. Uh, so, I mean, but cardio-wise, if you look at my first fight against Van Zyl, if you watch that whole fight, you're not going to be like, oh, his cardio was garbage. You'd be like, oh, shit, he good in the cardio department. Like, that, that's, that's maybe my strongest suit going into any fight is you – better beat me like because if we had to continue i was going to continue i have that cardio to go i was like like people like I, after that fight with andrew it was a five fight fight they're like you know could you would you want to go another round i was like i could do another fucking five let's do it like let's let's bring the judge back in here and let's do it like we could go five more i don't care um yeah, no, like, when it comes, like, I, I one fight I felt like my cardio peaked wrong because it was my first loss. It was against Odoms. That was kind of, like, I did everything wrong. Yeah, I took myself away from what I was doing. Um, and I did not practice the way, like, I practiced for a striking match, so I put, put a lot of emphasis on strike, 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 striking, that my striking cardio was there, but I wasn't mentally and physically prepared for a clinch battle. Mm -hmm. And he was. He practiced that. He was like, oh, he's a quest guy. They wrestle a lot. So he wrestled a lot. And I failed myself by not wrestling enough. And that, that, was, that was all on me uh, type of thing. It's not something I'm, you know, I'm upset about in the long run because, you know, it was a massively good learning experience where – I don't let that be an issue. I was like, if we want to grapple on the fence all day long, we, we hanging out there. But if you think that, oh, I'm going to get tired on the ground. No, no, we swim in, uh, we swim in, we, uh, on the ground, we will stand up for hours. I don't care. You pick a position, I'll beat your ass there for an hour. Well, that's a really, I mean, that's a really good thing, particularly as a heavyweight because one of the things that you see in heavyweights is I think more than any division because of the size, like you were mentioning, jiu-jitsu is different, everything's different because of the size um, that you're fighting at, that people do tend to specialize a little bit more. And I think being well-rounded clearly makes a huge, huge difference. It's one of the reasons why Stipe Mayocic is so successful. Not only does he have the boxing, not only does he have the, the fight IQ, like you were saying, he's smart, but he's been able to find He'll out wrestle an Nganu. He'll out strike somebody like a JDS. He'll, he'll out fence work. Who would have thought he would out fence control DC? I mean, it's some of the stuff he's finding is he's finding what works. And of course, the body shots, he's finding what works per fight, you know, as opposed to just coming up with a game plan. And I think that's a big thing that you bring to the table. Uh, transitioning to November now, um, what do you know about or even care about Oscar? as an opponent or are you more like you mentioned earlier, you just want to get better and develop you or do you study your opponent? Uh, I, I, I've watched a little bit of this film and like, I watch it like once or twice uh, just to kind of see, see what I'm kind of getting myself into. And then I hand it, I hand it off to my head coach, Zach. Uh, the dude just breaks down shit. Like I've never met like, 
he, I will be like, hey, I got this fight. What's your thoughts? Hour, hour and a half will pass, and I'll get like a two and a half like paragraph or two and a half like, like I would get like a novel sized text yeah. message, yeah. basically telling me the do's, the don'ts, what he sucks at, what he's great at. Um, like, okay, I actually have notes on uh, Rosenstruck because I was supposed, uh, I got offered a fight with him about a year, uh, two years ago before he got called into the UFC. Uh, my manager at the time was like, hey, I don't I don't like this fight, not stylistically, but he's a cheater. He's cheated before uh, in Risen and like it was a lower promotion. He was like, I don't want I don't want you grappling with this guy and you know, you can't keep your lock on because he's covered in Vaseline or something. Yeah. So we, we turned that one down, but I mean like I didn't really turn down. I'd be like, fuck it. I'll beat his ass on the feet. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, but my manager's like, I think this is a smart decision. I'm like, all right. I'm, I'm you know, I pay you for this shit. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you, you threw it at me and then, you know, you, you did some of your research. My coach did his research and it's like, they came together and like, Hey, we don't think this is the safest fight due to the fact that he cheats or he, he has cheated. I wouldn't say he cheats right. now, but he has cheated. Yeah. So, I mean, like, okay, I get that one. I like, I'm not like, I'm, but I have Zach uh, to do most of that. Yeah, he breaks things down. He does, he does it well. And I go from there. I take what he says. We work on what he wants me to work on. And we just, I just improve. Well, I think that's the good, I think that's the good blend because sometimes in MMA you hear guys afterwards say, we game planned for him to do this or this and then he didn't do that. And that's the problem sometimes if you over game plan because you can get locked in to what you need your opponent to do. And if they don't do that, then you're, you know, the fight can fall apart. So I think it's always best to make you better as a fighter. So that way, if they switch it up or they do something out of their character, which we were mentioning, Stipe, he's now, I think in the last couple of fights, has become better at switching stuff up and doing stuff that he hasn't done in previous fights. So it's always good to get better as, as you are. So um, it's really exciting. And obviously, we thought up until this week that you were going to be fighting in two weeks, and now you're going to be fighting in eight. So um, talk about your, your sponsors, anybody you want to thank, uh, because obviously this is a, a, a bigger build now. Um, instead of it just being two weeks out? Uh, right now, I just want to thank, uh, like, my gym for being here. Uh, I want to thank uh, – I want to thank uh, my, you know, my business partner, my – who happens to be the mother of my <laughs> – the mother of my daughter. Uh, you know, in, our relationship isn't the best of right now, but, you know – because she's such ingrained into my life that I'm just like, hey, you know what? Let's not try to lose this one. Let's let's work on, you know, your faults. So I'm trying to get, you know, work things out with my daughter's mother. Uh, you know, trying to make her feel like she's important to this game because she's always been the backbone and rock. Uh, and I've never really given her credit for that. And, uh, like, right now she's going through a lot of health issues. Uh, and so this fight – you know, maybe could have been uh, better for me because, like, a lot of health issues came up in the last two, week, three weeks. So I've actually been training and then coming home to make sure she's okay, helping her out. And, you know, it was, it was I don't know, there's something clicked that I was like, hey, you know, you know, this is your person. Uh, you got to take care of her. She's been taking care of you. Uh, she's, uh, she's, she helped push me into opening this gym. So, uh, I don't give that woman enough credit, uh, and I'm kind of starting to see that I need to. So I want to give a shout out to Lauren, you know, for being being awesome, you know. And you know, Dan's Dan Henderson's gym, you know, where I train at. Uh, old man Dan, you know, someone get him a cane. Uh, he, yeah, I'm sure he hates his jokes. <laughs> oh no, my goodness, Dan oh. Henderson. Woo. Oh, I call him old. I'll be like. He old. He's over fifty. Yeah. He's pushing fifty, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, still got it though. Oh, like, sure. I might, I might call him old, but he still got it. the age problem. 
has not aged. Oh no, no. Still, still been hit with it. Uh, yeah. Uh, my management team, Iridium, uh, got with them. Uh, beginning of this year, they've been fucking amazing. Jason Jacob, uh, the, the, the president, I guess rep. I, I don't want to like discredit Jacob, but I think they've both been amazing for me. So they've nailed it. Uh, they've given me this opportunity, so I really appreciate them. And thank you for having me too. Yeah, I always appreciate that. Well, hey, it's great. It's been great having you on. I'm glad you were able to kind of work through, you know, I could see you when you were talking, kind of working through the fact that you are a fighter, but you're also a gym owner. You're also a dad. You, you've got a family. It's a lot to balance as a person. And I'm glad you were able to thank her and kind of be a little bit more connected to who's been helping you because yeah. that's a hard part as a professional And I own candy fighter. machine too. Whoa, that's a lot of candy machines. Oh, no, that, that, those are like my not good ones. My other good ones are behind me. Wait, wait, wait. So, so let me guess something. You... You, you have a lot of kids come to train with you, and then you feed them candy, so they need to keep coming back. No, surprisingly, no. I actually like I have I have a candy machine out in front, but most of the people that use it is me, my own daughter, and my coaches. So they, they, they use the candy machine more than anyone else here. But I don't know if I don't know if that actually makes any sense. But okay, at least you've got. Um, a crap ton of canning machines. So. Yes, yeah, uh, I actually I took it over from my other coach, uh, Tom Glickio. Uh, he did the Ultimate Fighter twenty seven, and yeah, no, he, he he's he's that dude's been amazing for me. But he's moving out to Kansas, and he didn't want to take all this, so he sold me this, and then I bought the candy machines. Then I got caught up in buying a gym, and yeah. I like I like the fact that you you get yourself into a bunch of different business ventures. That's uh, very maybe not the brightest decisions of my life, but I was like, hey, I could do this. You're gonna be 75 years old still trying to do candy machines. I, I no, I'm I'm maybe not candy machines, but I'm one of those people that I just I I can't say no and not mm -hmm. try something stupid. Sure. Like, I've been okay. I'm also a big big time writer. I love writing. Nice. And uh, like I've been, I've written one book, uh, uh, front to back. I just I haven't sat down and fully edited it yet. Sure. Uh, then halfway through this quarantine, because I couldn't really do anything with the candy machines or the gym, I started writing another book. Uh, started editing that one though. I just, yeah, I like I like to be like, oh squirrel, oh another squirrel. Let, no, let me invest my time into all these things. But that's actually good when you think about the fact that when you see fighters, which they don't have a, they don't have like a mental outlet. I could see the book writing as something that you can recover during your body's rest during your mind's working, but you're able to kind of chill because one of the things that happens with pro fighters is sometimes they get the mindset that more is better. And then they kind of start getting into overuse injuries and other things as opposed to knowing when it's good to rest and recover. So oh, yeah, I yeah. agree. And we will have you back on the show, obviously, once, you know, once the fight happens and you can talk about Dana White contender series and all that. But also, whenever you publish that novel, we, we, we could do a special segment on the podcast, pushing your book, because that would be the first time ever I've had a fighter on to talk about writing a book. But it'd be great to. Thank to you. I mean, uh, yeah, no, I'm down. Well, I'd be down for any of the podcasts. Yeah, that would be fun. Well, you've been listening to Jared. Uh, thanks for coming on to the show, Jared, and we can't wait to see you November 4th. Obviously, that's a couple months out, but best wishes to you and, your, you and your family and your team. Thanks so much for coming you on. Too. You're welcome, man. Absolutely.